do call it conservatism. Having spent 20 years working for the Royal Mail as a postman, I feel most at home at blue collar conservatism. This is about people saying what they want us to do. So it's actually reversing the way politics is being done at the moment. I'm supporting blue collar conservatives' campaign for a police The effects of blue collar in the last few months has been incredibly positive. The fact that everything we have talked about, is like school funding, like more police services, is either government policy or soon to be government policy probably tomorrow afternoon. And why not have a drink and celebrate uh, right. Boris being on yeah. 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 for working people and that this party speaks for working people. You're up in South Yorkshire and it's one of those places where you utter the words I'm a Conservative and it does kind of feel like something that you shouldn't really admit but I do because I'm really proud to be a Conservative. I cannot wait for constituencies like the North East through blue collar conservatism to do really really well. We can be that blue collar revolution. The Tory party is now the Heineken party of politics. It is reaching the part of the country that other parties cannot reach. Elected as a, as a blue collar conservative from a traditionally Labour seat. A path that many have just followed. Driving forward the blue collar conservative agenda. Yeah. Your are but I would say there's another part too which wasn't covered, which I would call a kind of blue collar conservatism. Myself and other MPs in the blue collar conservatism group promised during the general election we would be on the side of hard working families. If we got How many people are brand new to the Conservative Party? That is quite a lot. The podcast is called Blue Collar Conversations. It came from a series of pub visits. That's where most of my great ideas have come from too. Make sure we hold some of these by the Thank you for joining us for day two of our Blue Collar Conservatism Conference. Today we're in the northeast of England and today it's all about levelling up and made in the UK. First we get a tour of Sedgefield, previously the seat for Tony Blair, with the new MP Paul Howell and in the debate later we'll be speaking to lots of local business people and the Tees Valley Mayor Ben Houchen. But if you want to have your say then email us on opinion at bluecollarconservatism.co.uk or join in the conversation conversation on social media with hashtag BCC20. It may not look like it today, but this was the battleground last December. It's the centre of where the British people lit a match under the political map to put Britain and County Durham on a brighter, better path. But the people here, like many across County Durham, broke voting habits of a generation to elect a Conservative MP for the first time. As we all know, a cement mix of anti-Corbyn and pro-Brexit sentiments solidified this change. But there was more behind the North East vote. A former mining community, the people here are blue collar through and through. If we were to pin it down to one underlying characteristic, the people here are patriotic. They voted for self-belief and national self-confidence. And with Bojo's mojo, the region has been reinvigorated with new hope. They voted in the North East to change the future of our country. But what does the future look like for them now? Rewriting the electoral history of this symbolic home of Labour's only successful leader of the past half a century, Tony Blair, is beyond imagination, which is why today we're visiting local businesses, people and politicians to see what steps government needs to take to deliver for them. I was born in Furry Hill itself. So this is Furry Hill Station, Furry Hill is literally next to it. I uh, lived here until I was about seven years old. My dad was a fireman in the town, so uh, we, this is where we come from. My, you know, my uncle used to live up there, my relatives were up in Dean Bank. This is you know, the part of the world that is my roots. You know, all right, I left when I was seven. I only went five miles down the road to Wakeliff. You know, and then I've been in Darlington, which has been you know, uh, where I've been the rest of my working life, if, if, to all intents and purposes. So when I lived here, that station actually had trains, you know. Um, I talked with my mum to try and work out whether I actually caught a train at that time, I don't know. Because, uh, you know, um, you are where you are with young families and, and, the, and the like, but, you know, 
this is where it is. I grew up in this part of the world. When I grew up here, it was a nice place to live. It still can be. It's still got the opportunity to, to move forward and become you know, a thriving community again, so that we get you know, the beauty of a station. A station brings economy and economic growth and all of the, the good things that go with that, as well as you know, what a number of these uh, residents have been saying, you know, the ability to get young people aspirations and going to jobs. And you know, that line can connect to Teesside in a heartbeat, and that's what we wanted to do. Reopening Ferry Hill Station has become Paul's top priority. He's supported by local people who think it's time a commuter town like Ferry Hill had a way to commute. I think the main issue we have as a, as a town, um, and again, it's a bit reiterate what uh, Dave said, is we have a lot of distrust for politicians because uh, me, not personally you, I personally voted for you. I think the issue is a lot of people in Ferry Hill have the attitude of what's the point in trying because it's never going to happen because we're always at the bottom of the food chain. We need to, more so as a community, try and build morale up and say, actually, we have a chance to get this done. You, you stand. The word politician very loosely, mate. In the past. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Especially yeah, for all those things, all the Labour people. They've looked after themselves in the past. And, uh, I mean, I've lived here all my life. You're the first one I've ever met. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is for real station. Um, but the, the road that goes out, there used to be factories and things all behind here. We've got Furriel Station, we've got Trimden Station, yeah. we've got Station Town. Yeah. And as no I've said station. and I've said before, the only thing we haven't got is a station. Is there no station? Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a microcosm of, of the way that the North East hasn't been looked after well enough in the past. This is a perfect example, and that's why I keep saying it's a perfect place to start, you know. If you go that way, you get to Bishop Auckland. If you go that way, you get to Bishop Midland, you get to Sedgefield and all this. So there is like a, a, a connection that people can get to from a number of villages. It's not just about, oh, as they say, the Bishop Auckland bus. It's just uh, coming on time. <coughs> East Coast Main Line goes that way. If you just look over the ramp behind us, you'll be able to look down and see the space where the station could potentially be and all the sidings and things. And that's where the Stillington Spur comes in, which is the connection that goes across to Middlesbrough. Because clearly, the economics of trying to put a new station on the East Coast Main Line don't work. The trains are going too fast, you won't be able to stop them. If anything, they want less stops in it. What we want is to connect Furry Hill to the Stillington Spur. Just so much better opportunity for connectivity, both physical and economic. Um, this line could connect directly into um, the Teesport and everything that's going on down there with the huge number of jobs that's being created through the Tees Valley Mayor's offices. And therefore, we boost the local economy here. I'm down here supporting our local MP um, to look at the reopening of the railway station. In Furriel, in general, this has probably been the hottest potato for the last 30, 40 years. Um, previously, we've had Tony Blair, Phil Wilson, as he's commonly known, um, all promising to reopen the railway station. Durham County Councillors have also had photo opportunities here. And the top and bottom of it is we've absolutely had nothing. Uh, false promises led down the garden path time and time again. However, at this time, we feel as though Paul's campaign and given the government's campaign to level up, we feel as though we've got a real chance of this station opening. I was born and bred in Furry Hill, and when I was a child, there used to be a big mine over here, and we had a main railway station, and it was a main. But over my 62 years, I've just seen Furry Hill systematically emptied and dragged down to the depths. I think one of the main reasons I would personally like uh, a train station opened up is for commuting to work. I'm very fortunate that I can drive, but I had a friend who was out of work 
for a while and he didn't have a car, it took him over three hours to get to Newcastle. If a train line system was here, he could be there in half an hour at the very most. That is the difference between having a job and not having a job. We've been promised the railway station for years by the Labour group. It's never happened. And if we couldn't get it open when Tony Blair lived here, and he lived here four miles away, then we're never going to open it. We've got a real chance now. We need to prove to people that for the last hundred years, everyone's voted the wrong way. Uh, open our railway station, please. Uh, Ferry Hill really now is a commuter town to what it was. Uh, a lot of the industry is gone, especially at Spennymoor, Rothmans, Court Halls, Black and Decker, uh, and so on and so forth. So we're basically a commuter town, but we're a commuter town without a facility. If we do get this railway station open, then that is going to be a massive bonus for the Conservative Party, who I actually voted for. And I would like to see them get in again. Best thing that ever happened to our town is, uh, is turning blue. Um, the reason I feel, and it's a little bit selfish, is because one, um, Conservatives are going to want to keep us, two, Labour are going to fight for us. So because we're such a, a voting uh, constituency, we need people to, to want us. And now we've got two parties that both want us, so they're both going to be fighting for us, which is nothing but good. Our whole family, for, since time began, voted Labour, and everybody just votes Labour. Um, but as I got involved in the town council, I started to see lots of cracks in Labour and I thought, this is not good. Paul's almost made as many friends in this area, gained as many votes in this area in the short time that he's been in power that his predecessor, Phil Wilson, lost in the same time. Uh, and that was a monumental defeat and hopefully Labour won't ever get another foothold here. But don't throw it away, it's yours to lose. I did complained to Labour and they've thrown me out. <laughs> so I was about to quit anyway, but I just don't agree with Labour politics in this modern day world. They're far too, well, to me, medieval. And we really need to think about the people. The problem is the local important people around here who are Labour look after their own towns. And I just think the Furry Hill, Bishop Middle and West Cornforth, all the little villages around here, with a railway line will really benefit from it. You know, um, obviously for getting to work and all sorts of things, it'll just be a brilliant benefit. I don't feel Labour's for the working class anymore, so that's why I decided to change from red to blue. Structural steel fabrication company. We moved to the property in back end of 2002 uh, and the offices followed in 2003. When we first moved in we didn't think that we would fill the property and now we're looking at extensions and extensions to office space um, so we've we've really done well. I think the family business, the family theme is quite prominent. We work all over the UK to start with the lower employees, just four, four in here and eight on the shop floor, growing to 65, 20 years, gone through a number of ups and downs, managed to get through it. It's about pride and yeah, made in the UK, definitely. I'm here on a Saturday on Newgate Street, which is our main high street. 
um, and you can see that we've got some empty shop units. We're not unique in that sense. Um, but there's a real sense in this community that we really want to bring the life back into our high street. And that's why I'm really pleased to see the government taking action on this with the Stronger Towns Fund, with the Future High Streets Fund, both of which Bishop Auckland are set to benefit from. So when I stood for election back in December, one of the things that I said I would do is fight to bring life back into Newgate Street and into the centre of Bishop Auckland. So I'm really pleased to be on the board helping to deliver that Stronger Towns Fund project. Uh, we've been listening to the local community, figuring out what it is that people want here um, and trying to make that happen. So watch this space. But, you know, why do we do this? Why do we want to get life back in that, into our high streets? Well, because we want people to have brilliant places to live and to work. My driving force for going into politics is to make sure that people have the opportunities to get on in life wherever they came from, whatever upbringing they had. And for me, that starts in our town and city centres. So high streets are key. But high streets are key because jobs are key. We need to make sure that there are great jobs out there for our young people to get. And we need to make sure that our young people are well equipped to be able to get those jobs. So it's about education. It's about training. So I'm so pleased to see the government introduce the Kickstarter scheme to get young people who are at risk of long-term unemployment into work in fully funded government jobs. Um, and making more links between young people and businesses, keeping people skilled up um, because COVID's presented a lot of challenges. And as politicians, it's our job to try and mitigate against those challenges so that people in communities like here in Bishop Auckland don't suffer. Uh, and so that we can bounce out of this pandemic stronger than ever, ready to take our country forward into the future that we deserve with absolutely nobody left behind. Here we are in Newton Neckbeth Big Club. And if you go about 100 yards that way, you'll find Sugar Hill School. That's the school that I moved to. So I was there for my, my junior years, you know, seven to 11 sort of time before uh, going to what was then the, the Avenue Comprehensive on the town. I'd have been 16, doing my O-levels and um, that sort of thing, which is, you know, you know, you know, the late 70s wasn't a good time in terms of industrial dispute and you can imagine the, the stuff that was going on there. And I think that what formed my position to a large extent as a dozen year youth, I think, um, where you know, I couldn't understand why the unions thought they should be in number 10. I have a lot of respect for unions looking after their employees and looking after you know, the rights of people and things like that. But, you know, politicians are elected to run the country and that's who should be running it. So I never really got that. Um, so that was where my, my roots were formed. I never really um, engaged in politics for many, many years um, after that. And uh, it's probably only about 2010, where I suddenly decided that I needed to get more involved with local politics. When I stopped work in 2016, um, I stood as a Durham County Councillor. Um, wait, they don't have Conservatives in Durham County Council, do they? Well, they do now. Um, you know, we, we got a few in um, at that time. When I think, I think before the elections in 2017, I think we had four in Durham County Council out of 126. Um, you know, there weren't, all the rest weren't all there, but there's a lot of independents and, and, and the like, but there was four Conservatives. At the 2017 elections, we had a massive success. We went from four to 10. The first thing locally for us making the biggest difference was Ben Houcher. Ben Houchen getting elected as the Tees Valley Mayor. And he's been such a refreshing um, change to local politics of a, a politician who, um, you know, Ben's catchphrase works exactly, you know, a record of delivery, a promise of more. And that's what he's done and he's done it incessantly. There are so many reasons why we got elected, you know, and, 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 and in this part of the world. And there's the all the usual culprits that are all part of the mix, Brexit, Andy Corbyn, all that sort of thing. But the fact that you had um, you know, a local politician who was just getting on with it, and people around here are straight talking. You know, if they think you're getting on with it, they'll, they'll thank you for it. If they think you're just ignoring them, then, you know, consequence is a result. And that, that's what we've got to do now. We've got to make sure we don't ignore them. We've got to make sure, or I've got to make sure, that um, you know, the people around here who, as Boris said, have lent me the vote, I think Labour forgot that the vote was lent. They thought it was given. 
um, and it wasn't given, it was lent and people just took it back and said no, we're going to use it somewhere else now and that's the opportunity that we've got and that's why we've got it now. Symbolic in the sense, but that's just because of its history, you know, it's because of we had a, you know, a Prime Minister who was the MP here as we all know. Uh, but the number of people whose doors I knocked on that said, well, yeah, he was Prime Minister, but he didn't do out for us. Uh, you know, you, the, when you were, you know, you, the, we one time had a Labour cabinet that was basically based in the, out of the North East. But you can go around the North East, go and look at the blue wall as it is now, what was the red wall, and talk to people in those constituents and they'll say, well, hang on, yeah, we had Milburn, we had Mandelson, we had uh, Blair, but it didn't do out for us. I think it's fabulous. I think I think it's a, it, 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 it's such an opportunity. I'm so frustrated by what's going on with COVID, obviously, and the distractions that that causes to the the process that we we started and that the government was committed to. I'm really pleased that we you know, that Boris has talked about doubling down on the infrastructure agenda. You know, it's about you know creating opportunities for our kids. You know, I mean, it's like we, we talked to some people today at Furry Hill Station and they weren't talking about things for themselves, they were talking about wanting the connections and the economy to be working for their children. You know, we have a number of marquee companies, you know, we've got 3M, we've got Hitachi, we've got Gestamp, we've got Husqvarna, you know, with the Finlay structures that we've been to today, EBAC, which is a, you know, EBAC as a company is just all about made in the UK. You know, the, the first you know, UK washing machines for a long time. You know, and people have a pride in that. From small beginnings but very rapidly grew into a substantial size business, originally with dehumidifiers and then over the years diversified into uh, domestic washing machines. This is the only UK manufactured washing machine. We're quite passionate as a workforce. Customers are looking for made in Britain items. And I do think we get a new generation of the younger generation now uh, with all the turbulence in the air in the world who are looking to purchase UK item manufactured products. Well my accent is slightly southern, uh, I've been here since I was 10, County Dolan through and through. But yes I used to, when I was working at the mine I was commuting over 100 miles a day, now thankfully the commute is 20 miles a day. The people in this part of the world have a lot of assets to offer, a lot of technical expertise, yep. it just needs to be pushed and pushed and pushed. The skill set in the area is unbelievable, it's just overlooked. So obviously we're passionate about developing the, the local employment uh, and to that level John took it upon himself with the other board uh, mem members to put the actual business into a trust and the benefit to the workforce is the business in essence cannot be sold. It gives job security to the yeah. workforce. Uh, the, the other positive about EBAC is we don't believe in temporary contracts. Everyone who's employed here is on a full-time contract from day one. So we are actively investing in the, uh, the local youth to, to be the future leaders of the business. Hi, my name's Peter Gibson. I'm the new Conservative MP for Darlington, elected in one of the red wall seats following the blue earthquake of December 2019. Our agenda of build, build, build and jobs, jobs, jobs 
is being delivered here with massive investment in things like our train station here in Darlington, which is seeing massive investment with expansion and additional platforms, increasing capacity and getting ready for HS2. We've got the prospect of our Northern Link Road on the horizon. And that level of ingenuity that's taking place here in Darlington speaks to the history and heritage that we have here. We're home to some amazing companies, companies like Cleveland Bridge, who are responsible for iconic structures like the Wembley Arch and the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And that sense of local pride about the output of local companies like that is something that we can really build on as we seek to expand global Britain in a new post-EU world. The pride that local people feel and that we can all feel in seeing the stamp of made in Great Britain being applied to our products and our services and our structures that we export around the world is something that we can really build upon. Okay, we're ready. Well, it's fantastic to be here in the Aviator Gin Bar in Sedgefield. And we're up here today because a lot has been written, a lot has been talked about, documentaries have been made about the collapse of the Red Wall and this uh, blue earthquake that happened in December 2019. But what I really want to know, was it such a surprise? Had there been a change going on for some time? What had been people been talking about in the pubs? Uh, what had workers been talking about in people's businesses what was the sense of on the ground of people wanting change in one way or another Ben, how should i should i start with you from a from a politician's point of view if you look back at the area so rather than just 2019 it, it's been on the cards for a long time could i tell you what's going to happen in 2019 no i mean can i say that jacob was going to win red car in 2019 absolutely not nobody saw that coming <laughs> except for the leader of Becca council actually who did see it coming um, Not even Jacob. <laughs> when, when you actually look back 15 years, I've, if you actually look back at the polls, you look back at election results, Labour have gone backwards in the Teesside, Darlington, Hartlepool area at every election, local, national, European, since 2005. And we kind of thought in 2017, as lots of people did, that maybe that was going to be the breakthrough year that then never materialised. Um, but then it came in 2019. We knew. I mean, before the election, I kept on saying to Peter, Peter, we're going to win Darlington. We're going to win Stockton South. My, my, uh, I said, Simon's going to be fine. And the interesting thing for me was, um, <laughs> the, the interesting thing for me was, do we get those three? But then I did have, I mean, you're right, Paul. I had Paul saying, can you come and help me in Sedgefield? Because we're going to win Sedgefield. Trust me, we're going to win Sedgefield. And I was like, you're not going to win Sedgefield, Paul. It's fine. It's fine. But I think that's the difference. We knew we were going to do well. But then the thing that in 2019 that happened is nobody just saw the extent to that change. Mm. And I think the big thing that, really kind of took us from a good result in Teesside as a Conservative Party to a fantastic one was all down to the way that Boris pitched the general election campaign and it was very Brexit orientated and it was about delivering on the people's wishes and let's be honest that goes down extremely well in Teesside when you think parts of Middlesbrough voted 81, 82% to leave the European Union I mean the messaging was just perfect and to be fair all the candidates are local as well. I do think that plays a big difference. How important is that sort of the transport infrastructure for whether it's exporting, whether it's getting to work, getting to school? Well, it, it's, it's, it's just critical, Esther. You know, I mean, as you saw in the, the things when we've been around today, talking to people, you know, we, we're talking, uh, we're at Furry Hill Station, talking to them about the potential there. And we had everything from talk, people talking about the local economy. But the biggest thing that was getting put at us was, you know, if we had a train that could get us places, our kids can get jobs. Our kids can go down to where that Ben's putting them jobs out in the Tees Valley. Mm. You know, it's, it's that sort of connection that, um, that we were getting. It's been the, the, that was the biggest single thing about it. It wasn't about, yes, they'd like to go to the seaside, yeah. but, you know, it's about the connections and the infrastructure. But that's and how it's isn't it, Paul? I mean, and, and it's the same for Peter and Darlington. We talk about the former steelworks site and the redevelopment plans and you know, the 15 year programme to create 20,000 jobs and all of those things are in hand. But you've got to get buy-in from further afield than just Redcar. And this, you know, you can go into Darlington and people want it to succeed because they think, well, actually with good public transport and good road infrastructure, I could get a job on there. 
or my kids could get a job on there and it means that they don't have to move away to have a better life and a better living standard. So the two are in integral, aren't they? I mean, it's about level playing field, promoting British, which I think also drove the Brexit vote, this idea that you know, we always play by the rules, the Europeans never do, and we actually need to be thinking more British. And you know what? I'm not particularly interventionist, although I did buy a local airport, but I'm not particularly interventionist. <laughs> but the idea is, well, you can play the kind of capitalist free market argument, but not when the Chinese and the Germans and the French don't, because you can play by the rules, but if nobody else is, then you're going to miss out. And I think that also drove the Brexit argument for, you know, whether it's trading standards, whether it's regulations, whether it's taxation. It's quite a complex issue that, you know, actually they did fantastically well to boil it down to get Brexit done. But the layers and layers and layers for businesses be below that is much more complex. Well, I'm going to ask that. I'm going to ask it to Cleveland Bridge. Has government really got the notion of this fairness in maybe the tendering process, this fairness in making sure that British companies get those jobs, can tender for it, and then get that, as we'd say, that uh, money flowing through into areas? Have we got that right? Is there things that we can change? Because I wonder if, if we have got it right. Um, we employ about 300 people, mostly uh, those 300 people in the Darlington area, they're all Teesside uh, residents, um, traditional places, welders, uh, engineers, uh, in a business that's been around for 200 years with some landmark, uh, iconic buildings right across the world from, from, um, um, from Victoria Falls to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, the Tyne Tees Bridge, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the Wembley Arch, um, first bridge to connect uh, across the Bosphorus, connecting, connecting continents, uh, the biggest bridge in China. So we have a reputation and uh, a pedigree second to none, I would say, in uh, UK engineering right across the world. Um, and we, we'd like to compete more. It's become a more difficult place to do business. Uh, as Ben has said, really, it, there, isn't, um, there isn't a furnace to international trade. The French, the Germans, the Belgians even, would you believe, have better terms from their respective export financed departments than we have in the UK. So they can offer better terms when we're competing with them in some of the uh, developing world in Latin America, in Africa in, in, and in Asia. Why do you think we've allowed that to happen? Because you're not the first person to have said it. Well, we said we were going to get this right in the tendering contract for many times. Is it because we want the cheapest product we can get? What is it that we're doing that we're not getting this, this right for our own companies in our own country? Don't get me wrong, we do it very well. Um, we just don't have the level of support that some of the other countries provide. They don't care. Mm. So the Americans connect aid and commerce. The British don't. They've been absolutely separated for an eternity. Thankfully now we see some indications that that may change and we hope that will be the case. Um, but that means we have, we have less in our armoury to compete with, mm. with the, against the Americans for instance or the Chinese who will provide subsidised funding as well as construction infrastructure activity. So we can only provide a certain level of that package or a certain part of that package in comparison with with our com competitors overseas. And now a lot of people would have said that was state aid, that mm -hmm. was because we were part of the EU bloc, but you were saying that the Spanish and the French and the Germans had got it better than us. They're just clever at it in the sense that they oh, were... Oh, I don't like the sound of that thing. No, they, <laughs> okay. they will subsidise their energy bills of their steel plants. So that's a way around the, the rules. So they will find creative ways, shall we say then, of bending the rules in their favour. They also break the rules. I mean, people always refer in Teesside, well, look what they did in Italy. You know, they, they put huge amounts of public funds in to save the Italian steel plant. Now, that's all been overturned, and the EU are now fining the Italian government for it, but it didn't stop them from doing it. Correct. And that goes a long way for people. It's like, you know what, sometimes, sometimes they want the government to break the rules to protect local people and local jobs. When I was out with, with Paul today, whether it was at Finlay, uh, the company there, whether it was at EBAC, this made in Britain, yeah. I really felt a sense from the workers, from the companies here, that actually that's what we want to do. And again, I think that is about the people sort of taking uh, charge themselves. This is what we want to buy. And that's why I talk about, you know, have we in this country had that earthquake, had that change, had that revolution, that actually people have taken back control in that regard? Are we going to do the made in Britain? 
Well, to pick up on that, Esther, just in terms of that sort of linkage, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at Itachi for this one, um, in the sense that you know, joining the dots in terms of government procurement, buying British. You know, what happened with the trains? One of the things on the, on the, you know, the political oh. landscape up here was the trains in Newcastle that were bought overseas instead of being bought from Itachi. And you know, people just didn't like that sort of thing. And they saw it, I think they saw it, as a Labour politicians in Newcastle not doing the right thing. And it was another thing that fit for us. But if you look at it more holistically, we as a government need to be better at that in terms of getting the right things into our procurement strategy that gives the right benefits to, to you know, to, to companies that have invested in the UK and, uh, you know, to take the socio-economic benefits of that sort of investment. Do you want to pick up on yeah. that, Nina, at all? Hi, so I'm Nina Harding. Um, we're, I work at Hitachi, so we're literally just up the road. We've got over 700 people that work there. Um, and we, the factory is just about to be five years old. And in that time, we've built over 200 trains. Um, so we've got an incredibly passionate workforce. Um, we're bidding, we keep bidding and bidding. There's not going to be huge rolling stock orders. There's a few coming up, uh, and we're going to keep bidding. But as Paul alludes to, um, I think there should be some kind of reward for bidders for UK content when you write your bid. Um, also, your social economic impact, what you do in the local community, all of those sorts of things. We're committed to our workforce. We want them to stay busy. We want the young people. We, we're a sponsor of the University Technical College down the road. We want those people to stay in the North East and know that there's jobs here in the North East for them. Um, and to be able to make that happen, we need we need to be rewarded mm -hmm. in tender processes um, for what that means to the local communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, it, it, Bridge. Yeah, so some you. people and some people think, oh, the, you know, people want money from the state as mm -hmm. it is. It isn't that you're just saying we want a fair crack at the whip. We, we're not wanting you to buy us off and we're not wanting state support. We just want to be able to tender fairly for it to look after our workforce and then the future uh, generation. And, and so, go on, Jacob, because I know you, you, you and Peter are always on your feet talking about this in the house. <laughs> and look, you couldn't hold him back there, could you? No, up, no, like no, a no, gazelle no, leapt no, from no, the no, seat. No, 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 no. I think, uh, touching on what Nina's just said there, about the, the, the fact that it's creating local jobs as well, and it's the same for Cleveland Bridge, it's the same for British Steel in my patch, where actually, if we commit to HS2 for a uh, classic example, HS2, we're not going to necessarily feel the benefits of HS2 in Redcar, but we will feel the jobs benefit if they decide to buy British in the procurement process for HS2, and we're already seeing some of the bridges for HS2 made overseas in France. And you have to think about not only the, the jobs impact of that, but also the environmental impact of it shipping thousands of tonnes across the sea, as opposed to making it right here locally and employing See, I was never British for people. HS2, but to find out the bridges for HS2 are made in France, I really am so not for HS2. <laughs> but, but there's other things though, isn't there? There's roads, there's, uh, you know, I said bridges, there's trains, there's local uh, trains that we need. We need our local connectivity, our yeah. infrastructure across the board, and you'll be fighting for those jobs whichever way they come. I don't know about bicycle lanes myself, but I certainly know that we need local train transport and I know yeah. we need uh, local roads. David? We're, we're trying to engage with um, Bayes at the moment exactly on, on this topic where um, there's ways to make things happen to make tenders, um, mm -hmm. the public sector particularly, yep. um, and the example I was, I was giving you, I mean, the, you know, it's, it's, we're trying to, you can link environmentalism, whatever, your carbon footprinting, I mean, the best example I put in the note to you is, you know, the, the Olympic Village in, in London didn't have one bathroom product made in the UK, um, and yet you go two years later, Glasgow, they put a carbon footprint pre-tender, yep. and guess what, every product was made in the UK, yep. and so you know, there are ways of making things happen. Um, and that's really what we're trying to, we're, we're putting together, we're just launching in January a, a portal um, for government purchase, but government procurement basically for all the Made in Britain members. Um, and really trying to drive that and embed that into tender processes, which I mean, it's, I'm, it's, I'm, not, it's not impossible. I, I'm as anti-EU as, as anybody. I really am, for lots of different reasons. But to not defend them too much, there are lots of things you can do within the current procurement rules that UK governments and local councils don't implement. I mean, even within the rules as we speak, with, with the steelworks, we're going through the demolition process, we're issuing contracts for site preparation, construction, and just the basics of saying, well, we're going to whack up 
what we think is the legal maximum of 20% lo uh, UK or local content socio-economic benefit. So 20% of it is just valuated on how close you are to the Tees Valley economy. And then the second bit is, well, if you talk about the environmental benefits, then logistics chains have to shorten because I think what local councils and governments have looked at, and this isn't to be so flippant with public money, but it's about saying governments understand the cost of everything and the value of nothing. And you know what? Actually, to do something with British Steel might cost us £10 million more than with a French plant. But that's 10 million quid that's going back into the local economy. It's creating more jobs. It's probably skilling more people, which means that those people would never have got those skills and therefore would have probably been sat long-term unemployed. And then the, the knock-on impacts, they're not capturing that value. And the big, the big test for the government at the end of the year and whatever happens with the Brexit deal or a no-Brexit scenario is change of procurement rules, get rid of state aid, customs union. That is the thing that is destroying the flexibility within the UK government to do it. Uh, Jim Mawson with uh, Cleveland Bridge. Uh, procurement rules are very definitely preventing us from winning more work. Um, just to reinforce Ben's point there, even the very simple steps are not taken. We see government contract after government contract, whether it's in highways or railways for us, major infrastructure that simply d d has zero requirement for UK, ben uh, UK content. Mm. So I, I worked with the American Bridge in Pittsburgh for four years. Everything there, American content, US content. I mean, it, you know, it, I've seen it, and I've, I've seen the jobs it protects. And uh, we do need to make more effort to invest in our own capabilities. And that, we, you know, we've studied for every contract we win and secure, 80% of the money, the revenue for that job is is is, is concentrated in Tees Valley through our supply chain. So we act as a conduit for for that cash distribution. And then, like Chris said, 90% of our workforce are Tees Valley, so uh, it, it's important. A great example of that, sorry to jump in again, Jim and Nesta, but a great example of that is we, on the 10th of September, we've got this procurement event for contractors for Darlington Station, Middlesbrough Station, various other railway stations that we've got. And I had a call with the, the top guys at Network Rail to talk about local procurement. And they gave me this spiel about, oh, well, we work with 800 SMEs across the country and we do this and we do that. They said, well, that's fine, but you do realise on this virtual event alone, we've got 480 local Teesside businesses signed up to want to get involved. So you're working with 800 nationally, but you've got 500 Teesside businesses that are saying, we could do this work. So the whole way in which they engage with the private sector is wrong. And because they're so process driven rather than outcome driven, it leads them to say, oh, look at this, aren't we nice? But actually the real outcomes aren't, aren't felt. Uh, it's a real problem. It's but a real what problem. will usually be levelled back is, oh, you're inward looking, you're protectionist, that goes against our very nature of being global. So what's the counter argument to that? I don't think it is protectionist at all. I think if we don't have a strong economy, we can't ever look outward. It's quite simple, really. We need, we need the jobs here, we need to manufacture, we need to you know, uh, do all the good things we always did and can still do, it's still there. It just needs to be reinforced and, and assisted in, in the ways that we already can. Um, and that will allow us to be outward looking and reach out and partner with uh, you know, Japanese companies, US companies, Turkish contractors, Greek companies. It won't prevent us from, from doing that. And it's a transition as well, isn't it? Because if you take energy pricing as a, as a perfect example, you've got states across Europe and the world subsidising energy prices. So businesses aren't investing in the UK because we've got an abnormally high energy price. And that's not, that's not level playing field, that is states subsidising energy prices. Our government doesn't, and therefore we're losing investment we would have got in the UK that is now going elsewhere. And that's not about interventionism, that's actually about being o as open as possible. And that's why we came... Exactly. And that's why I wanted to come to Sedgefield today, care of uh, the invitation of, of Paul there, was to get this, I'd call it the common sense voice, the voice of the people to say, wake up at what you're getting wrong in Westminster. This is what we need because we've got to look to the future for jobs, I don't know, whatever else, R&D, creativity, you know, expansion, uh, you know, it's, it's helping our companies grow. Jacob. I don't think this is a call to just buy anything with a Union Jack printed on the yeah. side of Why it. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying, Jacob? I, th I think you know, what, what we're saying is that, that ultimately it has to be taken in, into consideration. And at the moment, it's not. To yeah. have the, the, the local impact of creating jobs in the UK and, 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 and the effect that that has on the local economy, 
Whereas at the moment, we're just bypassing that, that part of the system altogether. So it's not just, let's buy everything with the Union Jack on, or that protectionist argument. It's actually just saying, well, actually, let's consider the social economic benefits of choosing to go for a British company. But it also builds on what we said you know, earlier on about you know, the, the kids in Furry Hill wanting to get the jobs somewhere. If you haven't got the companies here, they don't get the training, they don't get the apprenticeships, and the whole thing fizzles down so that you haven't got an opportunity to even compete in the future. And then it's backwards, isn't it? So we won't, we won't help and prioritise lo uh, local businesses, which you're right, is an element of it, but not the be all and end all. But then government provides mass subsidies through grants and ERDF to try and make up for it. And you kind of think, well, they're, they're doing it, and they're doing it in a really cack handed way. If they just did it directly, you'd end up saving money in the circle anyway. I'm Julie Raystrick, uh, Managing Director of Finley Structures, which is based on the business park, uh, family owned, celebrating 20 years this month. Um, we employ 65 um, staff. Um, we don't export, we're purely UK based. I wouldn't like to think I was exporting. Um, we're quite fortunate at the moment, we're working very local. All of our uh, labour is locally um, sourced. Um, when we did the Hitachi uh, contract, we did have to demonstrate that our steel was purchased um, from the UK, um, which we did. But I think at that point it was a bit too late for British Steel. So it was after the event. So the demonstration for us is not part of a contract to say, where have you got your steel from? You must purchase from here. It was only after British Steel that we were asked the question, did you actually buy the steel locally? Do you think, you know, again, I'm going to bring Peter in here. Do you think politicians talk enough about this? Do you think we're talking enough about the regions, about the jobs, about uh, level playing field in different ways? We talk about level playing fields, but what have we really meant by that? Have we thought that's a little bit more infrastructure? Have we thought that's a nicer looking high street? But have we really thought, what is it that drives the money the opportunities, uh, the taxation that keeps the public sector going. Have we really thought enough about business? Esther, this isn't complex at all. We're, we're emerging from this pandemic. We're trying to encourage people to shop local, buy local on our high streets, to rejuvenate our high streets. And government can do exactly the same with its spend. By shopping local and spending money with British companies, it avoids the intervention of having to relocate money around the regions because it's protecting those jobs. We've also heard examples of how it reduces our, green fo uh, our footprint. So it's green and it levels up. So shopping local, buying local and buying British is the answer. Adding on from that, how do we relocate businesses up north? I mean, what is our USP? Or am I talking out my hat and I could be sat down in the southwest and they go, no, we're brilliant. I mean, what is it that we have here? as a group of people? Is it resilience? Is it energy? Is it grittiness? What is it? And I'm going to speak to businesses again that you know keeps a business going for 200 years. Part of the business, then we clearly have the skills. We have the engineering capability, we have the construction capability. So you know, at the forefront of what is required, we can satisfy the needs, the needs of UK PLC in, in building a better future. Um, fundamentally, you know, with the legacy that we've got going back 200 years as a business, then there's no doubt that we've, we've got resilience as well. Uh, as a community, living through what we have over that 200 years, living through multiple ownerships, living through recessions, boom and bust periods, we've come through that and we've come through that strong and we've got uh, a track record and a capability that, that reflects that. Is COVID changing the country's landscape? Are people going to be moving out of maybe London and the bigger cities more to the regional cities think, and I the think, north? I think we have accepted to a degree we've been conditioned by the fact that we do play cricket, we do play uh, by the rules and that has meant that we've been less, perhaps less ambitious or perhaps less adventurous uh, than we could have been because uh, fundamentally we are a trading nation and, and that's the sort of spirit that we need to uh, regenerate and, 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 and re-energise, uh, you know, re I would say, once more. It's also partly as well that manufacturing, chemicals, processing are, are not seen on a national scale as, as sexy industries. You know, it's not digital, it's not tech, it's not making computer games. But actually, 
that plastic bottle or that paint on the wall or anything that goes into makeup doesn't exist without the chemical industry. Ben, you're going to make it sexy. That's well, what you're going to do. You guys, I mean, that's what I'm saying. You guys in this room, yeah. Paul's making but that's the difference. it sexy. And the thing that, I think the thing that's starting to change the North's fortunes, and in particular the North East fortunes, is the, the move from the chemical and processing industries to, from those traditional industries into those clean technologies, ha, ha, uh, car, uh, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen. So all of a sudden, you are going to get a lot more young people, a newer generation, saying, actually, I do want to fight climate change. How do I do that? Well, you know what? The best way of doing that is becoming an engineer and a scientist and figuring out that, you know what? Hydrogen can replace natural gas. You burn it, you get water. Do you think we do have I that? Mean, I mean, people talk about, oh, they're friendly up north. They chat and whatever they say as they're on buses, on coaches, we chat, have a conversation, have a stronger community. Do you think, uh, you know, that is the case, and I say that, and I'm going to bring in Neville here, who runs a coach company, and I have to say, I thought it was fantastic how you started your coach company going. You went round all the pubs and the clubs and was taking the Domino's team round, the darts team round, whatever it was, um, and got like a community sort of coach company going. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Can I just say, Paul invited me to this do today. Um, he said, you know, Esther McVeigh will be here and, and Ben Houchin will be here. And Jacob will be here. And I thought he meant Reese Mogg. I wouldn't have come. <laughs> <laughs> we were okay. It was oh, just yeah, Jacob just, that you wouldn't have come for. Um, yeah, we, um, my father uh, was retired from the fire brigade. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm totally out of my depth here. We employed 12 guys and we don't go past Scotch Corner anymore, you know. Um, times have changed uh, in the coach industry. Um, sadly, we're, we've got our, you know, we're up against it. Um, a few years ago, the the PSVAR regulations came in for accessible transport for, for school children even. Um, so, so now, whereas you, you know, years ago, the, your end of life coaches would have just dropped onto the school runs and it, it didn't matter whether they ate the seats or you know, it, it pulled the curtains down because that was what they did. Now they have to have a lift for just in case anybody wanders along who happens to be in a wheelchair. Uh, so instead of having end of life vehicles, you now have got midlife vehicles. So, you, you, you know, whereas a 10 grand motor would have done a school run, you're now looking at a 60 or a 70 grand motor to do a school run. Rail replacement, when the trains break down, when the leaves are the wrong time, you can't turn up at the railway station anymore with just an ordinary coach to run from Darlington to Newcastle. You have to have something with a tail lift. And then next year, when you go into Newcastle, you have to have something with Euro 6 because you've, you've approved all these clean air zones everywhere. Yeah. You know? Um, we've, we, re, you know we, we could have done without COVID. Everybody could, obviously. But... Um, with so, and, and that's another angle, isn't it? Government needs to be aware of how quick the change in rules needs demands on businesses that it can keep up and catch up. And I just think, and I don't know if we've talked about the changes with social distancing and, and, and COVID enough there, and that's why I wanted to bring you in, because something like coach companies, travel companies, anything that involves social distancing is going to have a massive impact. But the coach industry is going through a really tough time at the moment. The, the, the largest, largest coach company in the UK has gone bust. Sheeran's went bust you know, this year. 500 you know, nearly new uh, holiday coaches are now back in the dealer's yard. The value of everybody's fleets has been slashed because you can buy something that Sheeran's have only got 18 months out of for, for you know, 100k rather than 200k or whatever. Um, it, we, we, we really are up against it and as you say, you can't carry 53 kids on a 53 seater anymore um, you know, you can maybe get 10 or 12 on you can't take the guys up to the it's not football, is it? but the old ladies who want to go for a ride out you know, we can't do them it, we, it's, it's, a, it's dark times for the, for the transport industry um, if you can find a little hotel in Torquay that's even open you can maybe take 14 old people to it instead of 54 uh, so, you know, that, that £189 holidays going to have to be £389 just to break even. With a bit of luck, we'll, we'll get a lot of more people holidaying in the UK in the next few years, just just to stay away from the aeroplanes. You know, there'll be, there'll be a hardcore of people who are a bit like, oh, no, give the aeroplanes a miss. I mean, you know, do we really want to go to Spain and Italy where it was really nasty? You know, we'll, we'll do a bit on the south coast or we'll go to the highlands, but we can't do it well. We could, we've only got 20 people on a coach. It's, it's, it's never going to work, you know. I think I don't, uh, I, don't, I don't listen to you, Jacob. Wrong. Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think I think Neville's Neville's hit the nail on the head. You know, the coach industry specifically um, is going to struggle massively while we have social distancing in place. And one of the things that uh, myself and some of our, my other colleagues have been pushing for is is a form of asset furloughing, where whereby coach the coach industry can can furlough its 
its coaches, the, the good coaches, um, so that they're still there in a few years' time, because otherwise we'll see all of these coach companies collapse and actually leave good assets, like, like you've just said there, uh, to go to waste. And the, the, other, the other aspect is I think um, we need to come up with some specific regulations for coaches in terms of how they're able to, to increase capacity on there. So whether that's um, shields between seats or something like that. But, but like Neville said, the coach industry is, is completely, um, you know, it's, it's unviable when you've got 53 seater coaches only packing 10 kids on. Yeah, and when I, at the beginning, talked about this blue earthquake, Actually, COVID, I think, has given another earthquake, a rippling across the country, as I said before, from the big cities to people moving to the regions. They probably didn't know, if I'm being brutally honest, what to expect if you come to uh, the northeast, the beautiful countryside, as you say, the beaches, the space, what you can afford if you buy a house here, what's the you know, education, what's the schools like? And actually, is it a renaissance now that we're getting across the North Pole? I think there's, there's a lot of that, Esther. I mean, I think there's so many dynamics that's going to change with COVID. You know, whereas everybody wanted to go to London before, um, because of work, because of this, because of the other, there's going to be a huge percentage of the population that are going to be saying, well, I'm not going down there. I don't want to be on them tubes. I don't want to be in that crowded environment. You know, so the opportunity of actually, you know, if, if, you know, we've talked before about trying to move government departments up here. You know, now, the opportunities for that have got to be better now than they would have but been But do then. we want government departments? Don't we want business to say, actually, you can rent your office space, you can have big sort of industrial uh, warehouses, you can have much bigger space, you, you can have you your want, staff no, 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 here. No, no. What, what, what is it we you want, want here? Do, we, uh, do we explain why you want both and you don't want business you and, yeah, and yeah, energy oh, here? Yeah, you go first. Because you've got to... Ha it, 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 this is not an uh, either-or situation. You know, if you've got government departments up here then they'll understand what we're about and they'll try and you know, then they'll have a much better comprehension of what this part of the world offers and where it can go from. But you've actually are, we, are we going to move Parliament to here? Is that what you're saying? We want no, no. the House of Commons up here as it's uh, being refurbished. Why not bring it up to Sedgefield? I think the issue no is... No better part of the world. <laughs> the issue is largely, as I see it, and, and the work that yeah. I do with civil servants as well as... Because I think politicians get it, because politicians are obviously from all over the country. The civil service isn't, though. And we talk about the North and the South, and I think the reason that the North gets concentrated on as being so left behind or not getting the benefits that it could get is because it's, it's, it's less cosmopolitan in that it's less city orientated. So I, I mean, you have colleagues in Parliament in Cornwall, like Scott Mann and others who complain, well, we're just as poorly off as the North East. It's a cities and everyone else argument. Yeah. And if you have the civil service in London, or if they're not in London, they're in Leeds or Manchester, they don't get what the rest of the country's about. And if you're going to, the reason, you're absolutely right, yeah. business needs to come to the north. But if you move government departments out of major cities, London, ideally into places like Teesside or other suburban town areas, then all of a sudden, you know what? They stop concentrating on the tube system in London and they start talking about, well, actually 80% of the people in the Tees Valley drive, so maybe we should build better roads. And you don't get people off the road. You don't say cars are bad. You say, well, actually, how do we move more quickly to electric or hydrogen vehicles? So rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater, you get people who have spent all their lives in the southeast or London realising, you know what, the challenges outside of cities are pretty different. Now, when they tried to do that in the sort of the 80s and the 90s, moving government departments out, it didn't really work. It no, just it seemed that you duplicated yeah. staff on what you did, and it was much slower. Yeah. But I'm wondering, if we look at opportunities for COVID, now people can work Work. It's much quicker, it's online, you can communicate with people, you can Zoom meeting, whatever is Microsoft Team. Is this then an opportunity to get some of those government departments out of London? Because those excuses that it had to all go yeah. back to London because of that time delay does not exist anymore if we're going to be speaking to people virtually. So is now the time? And would businesses find that beneficial? Because I'm aware as the sort of the, the wealth creators, would you find it beneficial for us to get some of that sort of business, that, that sort of political know-how, those civil servants out here, if we're wanting to make this a, a even more prosperous part of the country. I think we, as a politicians, just to finish on that point, as to we talk when we talk about moving government departments out. If you're going to do it, you need to move the DGs and the permanent secretaries out, so the decision makers are out. So what you do is you flip it. You have the actual departments in the regions, and you have a like a satellite office in London. Because you're right, because of the technology, why, why do civil servants on 150 or whatever it is, thousand pounds a year, they don't need to be in London. 
They don't. The permanent secretaries don't because but they're not dealing with day-to-day -day business. And does this now help? We're going right back to the very beginning to understand the procurement issues, yeah. to understand that wealth needs to be kept in the areas, to understand to buy British. Would that be helpful? I, I, I'm going to make sure a boom might get there, so I don't know whether uh, Chris or Jim or David want to answer that. About an export opportunity in Africa or, or in the Far East. Uh, they do have representatives in the region, but if you want a decision, you have to go to London, unfortunately. And, you know, they don't understand, as has been made eloquently here, they don't understand the value of local wealth and local wealth creation. Um, when we, we undertook a project in South Wales and we were able to demonstrate that, in, apart from the steel that was shipped from, from the North East, 80% of what we spent on that project was in South Wales, was within 25 miles of that particular installation. That's what the Welsh Government wanted us to demonstrate, that's what we were able to prove. So absolutely invaluable and it, you know, it, it, it met the requirements. We want to see more of that. I think there's a greater opportunity to, to have that multiplier effect in the local economy from that infrastructure programme that the Government is sponsoring. So there's undoubtedly big opportunity. Let's decouple from London, absolutely support that. Um, give some empowerment to the regions to allow them to, to direct. and to be, They're closer to the requirements of the regions, so let them make the decisions locally. I mean, I, I, just a short anecdote, and I wonder how many businesses have got similar anecdotes to this. I mean, I've always lived in the North East, but my wife was fortunate enough. We went to a comprehensive in Yarm together, Conyers, and she was fortunate enough to go to Oxford, um, doing French and German, and having never lived out in the North East, went down there for four years, enjoyed it, came back, and is now a teacher in, in Stockton. Um, the number of times we've tried to get her friends to come to Teesside, and they're all a bit like, mm, I'm not really sure about that. And you can tell, they're like, I don't really want to go to Teesside, I don't want to come to Middlesbrough. And after a lot of haranguing, you get them up here, and you see them look around, and you go, this isn't what I was expecting. And you take them to places like Yarm High Street, or you go to Saltburn, and you think, hang on. And you say, well, hang on, you live in a four-bedroom house in, in Yarm, and you've got outstanding schools, and you've got the North Yorkshire Moors, and you're right next to this. Like, How much is that? Well, you can probably go out buy that four-bedroom house for £200,000. And these are like, you know, accountants, lawyers, working at Deloitte or wherever it is, you know, working all hours God send, and they're sat in a crappy bedsit in London. Thinking, and you can see in their eyes, they think... Have I got this wrong? <laughs> but it's true, and I'm yeah. sure it's the same but for business, I you, isn't it? it I mean, you it's the long. first time now that they know, A, they can work from home, that we are sort of going to be internet connected, that you have got broadband, that they're really thinking about it. Before they went, oh, well, that would be nice, but I've got to go back to, you know, the square mile or, or sort of London. But that, that's to why be I able disagree, to, though, Esther, because... But the, they the, thought the, that was for their career path. No, but I don't think so, because you could say, well, you know, you go and work for... Oh, I'm saying not now. Hey, listen, I'm no, a no, strong before, advocate. No, but you would say PwC, I will go I work for PwC in the London office. I say, well, you know what? There is a genuinely top-of-the-range niche accountancy firm that specialises, for example, in shipping. It's based in Teesside. But they would never know about it because they don't expose themselves to it. So you think it was that they didn't know? Yeah, it's definitely not a didn't that know thing. they thought we want to stay in that sort of that group huddle I in central so. London because they thought we could be missing out. I'm just saying COVID now gives you the opportunity. You'll never be missing out because you can Zoom somebody yeah. straight away, yeah. be there or not. And if now everybody's thinking about the health and green space and environment and, you know, this, that, the other, um, then they can be up north. Richard, I know yeah. I haven't heard from you. I, I, I'm aware. I could see you there, but I hadn't called you in, sorry. You're much politer than uh, us. No, us no, lot I'm not like here. Jacob who jumps up all the time, <laughs> even though he's not the right Jacob for everybody who's here. <laughs> uh, no, I think one of the, uh, it's interesting you talk about green space and stuff and uh, investment in the local area. I think one of the things we also need to look at properly now is the green book and the rules on, on, on infrastructure spending. Uh, and I think actually COVID has probably fundamentally helped change that for us as well. It's much, you know, my constituents really relied on furlough because, you know, I've got a lot of people who work in manufacturing. My people who do work in the service sector are not in very high paid service sector jobs. They're in service sector jobs, which means you need, need to go and be with somebody else. So actually, you know, th that's, and the work from home thing, uh, it doesn't, you know, it's, it doesn't quite apply to them, but for transport for us, uh, it's, it's massive. And I think, you know, we need to really look at some of the big projects that are being pushed. You know, Crossrail 2, I don't think we should be even contemplating that at the moment until we really uh, have a proper, uh, you know, look at the work, you know, the change of, the change in work in London. I really hope we're going to get some people up to the northeast. you know. If we can also, uh, as the Prime Minister said, get some of the broadband uh, connections in, you know, I've got great rural areas which people would love to live in, uh, you know, in the Durham Dales, uh, and people uh, would, you know, could work from there if they had really 
good broadband connections. Uh, you know, and also the, the, the biggest thing I think for the region is uh, linking, linking us all together. So you've got Ben down in here in Teesside who's doing great stuff. You've got, we've seen a, a real redevelopment starting to take place and you know, it has taken place in some parts of Newcastle city centre. But you know, it's the transport links into those areas. I've got no rail line in my constituency at all. I've got no dual carriageway in my constituency, but it's you know, how we can link into these big growth areas. You know, and, with, you know, and we want good metro mayors like Ben you know, who are gonna really lead the charge for the rest of the region as well. And, and I think those local connections, that infrastructure in yep. the local community is key, road, rail, whatever it is, absolutely, absolutely uh, is key. And I think that championing of those local mm -hmm. areas, you know, Ben, you of the region, the MPs, obviously, for each of their constituencies is what's going to uh, be key. If I took a message now going back to government, I'd say the procurement and what we do and how we do it smart and savvy and make sure that money works well in the UK. And it isn't about protectionism mm -hmm. and it isn't about... Uh, giving an unfair advantage to us. It's actually about this level playing that field that we're talking about. And I also want to uh, bring in sort of the coach companies as well as a form of getting people from one place to the other as transport, understanding now the significant hardship that is going through that sector as we deal with social distancing. And I think the end on, uh, and David being on the board of Made in Britain, I think that is key. Yeah. And more than anywhere else, and I go right across the country, that patriotism that I have felt here of the, you know, the, the, the staff, the business owners all saying, let's put this stamp on, let's buy in Britain and support ourselves as a country, I think is gonna be key. Paul, it's your seat. Um, please tell us, you know, finish, uh, the debate for us on, on key takes we need to take away. No, I, I, th I think you've summarised most of the key um, points there, Esther. But one of the things that I think is important as well is this is about commitment. It's not, you know, we want commitment from the government. We don't just want a one-off. So if I use like the, the rail situation as a metaphor, if you like, and I'm following the sort of things that Ben's talked about in the Tees Valley, where it's, it's, you've done something, but what's next? So, I mean, everybody knows from where I've done in Parliament so far that I'm talking about Furrow Hill Railway Station and wanting to get that in, and that's a quick fix, if, in my eyes, in the real world, to, you know, it's, it's one station sort of thing. But you don't just want that, you then want the next step, which is like the lame sideline, which then connects you up into Newcastle, and it makes a much better connection. It's part of the all HS2 um, agenda in terms of having a better rail network. And it's about that commitment for not just the first step, but the second, third, fourth, to give people confidence that we, we can do things. Um, I think to go back to what you said about you know, what's different about us, it's in our DNA to do proper work and proper manufacturing. And you, know, it, it, you therefore have an expectation from people that if you can provide and f facilitate the growth of, in, of, of businesses, the people want that. You know, we, do, we don't sit with um, you know, the, the service sector jobs and the, you know, the, the stuff that goes on um, on the, you know, you know, the, the stock exchange type trading and all of that sort of thing, which is your London centric things. We're about manufacturing and people, anything that we're doing as, a, uh, as politicians to try and support the growth and, and continuance of manufacturing in a sustainable way, not something that's just going to be the next year, it's going to be the next 5, 10, 15 year. You know, like the SSI site, it's a big long term project. And I think that's what the government has to do. We have to really get behind the whole project, not just a couple of specifics. Made in Britain. Absolutely. You, you summarised very well, I think, the, the vibe in the movement. Um, to me, you know, the, the opportunity with, you know, leaving the EU coming up now, you know, I think we've, although we were always called the bad Europeans, in my experience, we were actually the good ones who actually kept to the laws. Um, now we've got a chance to actually be a bit fairer to ourselves, to me. And, you know, I think it's very unfair that, you know, Metro in Newcastle is buying trains from Switzerland. I think that's ridiculous. I don't know anyone who thinks that's a good idea. Um, so I think, you know, we've, got, we've seen the ceramics industry wiped out because Chinese subsidised their own. You know, we've never stood up now, I think there's chances to actually rebalance things and have a bit of a reboot. And actually, you know, if we are favouring ourselves, good. I'm all in favour of that. 
I think it's important as well from a political standpoint that it, I think it's quite simple. I think if the government delivers on its manifesto promises, the North will benefit massively. It's why the North, the North voted for the Conservative Party. It's why places like Teesside did. But you've got the counter side to that coin is if you don't, those, and I absolutely believe this, even in Teesside, those votes have, on, have only been lent to us. People want to vote for the Conservative Party again because they want to be proven right that they were right to do it. But if we don't do it, they'll easily just say, they'll, what they'll do is they'll go back to what they did in the 90s and they'll say, same old Tories, you know, I shouldn't have trusted them. They want to believe, but we've got to deliver on that now. But that's where I think understand the power in your hands across the north. The red wall did crumble. People were looking for something different. Absolutely. So remember how powerful that voice and that say is. Paul? No, no, the only thing I definitely want to say before we finish, Esther, is just thanks to everybody for coming. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, for this, we did this at fairly short notice, and I uh, really very much appreciate the reaction you know, from the business uh, community here to come and, and do this. What is the Conservative Party doing to help people like Joe in Ferry Hill and level up towns like Sedgefield? I think it's a really exciting time, you know, since I've been Secretary of State for Transport and I'm looking after the, the Northern Powerhouse as well. Every time I come and meet people, I meet people like Joe Quinn and his friend who say, I can't get around, I can't move around the area. If places like reopening things like Ferry Hill Station could make a big difference to people like that. But it's also the bigger projects as well, being able to get in and out of the region. Things like Teesport for the goods, but or obviously the airport, which could have so easily closed. All these Conservative MPs, a Conservative Mayor, were really starting to see a difference on the ground. It's exciting times and we absolutely intend to deliver for them. What will you do to help coach companies like J&C Coaches in Sedgefield during this pandemic? I know times have been unbelievably tough for a lot of businesses, but coaches have really suffered actually in a way that um, you know is really threatened and indeed has sent some of those um, businesses down because uh, of course people haven't been able to travel, they haven't been able to move around and unlike buses for example, they don't have the state subsidy either. So it's, it's tough times and I really respect that Neville Jones has JNC coaches company having to get out there and now try to rebuild that business and what we're trying to do to make that easier is start to get things moving again people are now starting to go back to work coaches are being used actually quite often now to take children um, to school now schools are back and those things are starting to help and I know there's some really long-term issues there are some regulations the PSVAR regulations which um, do require uh, more uh, 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 adaptation uh, I know they've been coming over in uh, over a couple of decades, so I know it's not a recent thing. Uh, and of course then COVID has hit as well. I think the best answer for all of these things is to get the economy moving again as we move beyond uh, the immediate restrictions of COVID. And we know it's going to be tough for a while as we go perhaps through to uh, next spring. Um, but uh, I think the important thing is that we don't close down the economy, that we allow uh, people like Nevin, Neville Jones to run his business. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to enable people to find those new markets and stand by people to help run those businesses as we've done through things like the furlough scheme uh, when things were completely locked down. We'll now look to ways to help as things open up. How important is Made in Britain to the government? I think it's incredibly important that, you know, as we recover from COVID and actually as we build all these big infrastructure projects, many of them uh, in, in the north, many of them in the, in, in the red now blue wall seats, what we've got to do is make sure that we're building stuff in Britain, we're buying the stuff from Britain. I know there's some brilliant companies like eBac, for example, uh, who make um, things that are actually, you know, white goods that you can't buy. Uh, from any other British company in some cases and I think if we support those companies as we've supported our communities through the coronavirus and the, the recovery that we're going through then that is surely a route through and I think there's one more thing, thing as well wherever you were on Brexit it is undeniably the case that we will be able to be much more independent and much more independently minded and I'm not saying everyone has to go out and buy British things as a result but I am saying yeah, that actually we, we can be unashamed unashamed about backing our own industry and helping people to work their way uh, up and out and that is a fantastic way to build communities, economies and 
improve people's lives. So I think uh, there's a real spirit of that uh, throughout the North and, uh, and you know, really encourage everyone who's, who's pushing the agenda. Will government listen to the concerns of businesses tonight and review its procurement processes? So I think there's a lot we can do on procurement, particularly on these big projects. So uh, with HS2, for example, a lot of the supply chain will come through the UK. With, with, with Network Rail, who are spending £48 billion right now fixing up railways, extending rails, 98% of the uh, uh, steel, for example, comes from uh, the UK, comes from Britain. So it's really important that we uh, do back um, you know, businesses like Cleveland Bridges. So I know built bridges around the world, but if we're building them here, how fantastic to have a company of that quality in this country who can help to build and finish off our infrastructure. So uh, really important, I think, to make sure the supply chain is supporting the jobs and the apprentices and uh, that the whole thing fits together really well uh, if we can encourage that sort of approach and I know with some of these big projects uh, we certainly want to make sure that British companies are benefiting. Of course they've got to be competitive but where they are they should get the contracts. Why should first-time Conservative voters continue to support our party? Uh, the thing that's making the biggest difference, I think, is just having brilliant Conservative MPs and Conservative representatives on the ground. Some of these seats have been promised stuff for so long, have always been Labour through and through, you know, that's why it was the Red Wall, and now they've got Conservative MPs who are actually out there doing things every day. I mean, people like, you know, Peter Gibson, um, people like uh, Paul Howe, people like Rick Holden. I I'm hearing from them, but well, I think it's like every day. And, you know, and they, they're just pushing and pushing and pushing. And of course, having Ben Houchen there as the mayor was the start of it, but it's also been really significant. And it means that when people vote Conservative, they're actually seeing some, some really proactive representation on their behalf. And we're going to make sure that shows them delivery as well. So things actually change for people as well, which I think after all these decades will just be a revelation for people. And it's all happened because people have voted Conservative for the first time. Any final thoughts on tonight's virtual conference? I think it's why it's so important that Blue Collar Conservative Conference is out there, going around, talking to people, talking to businesses, uh, hearing what communities have got to say, and then actually helping uh, those of us who are you know, trying to do things to assist and working in the government, running the government, to actually understand. And I think it's a really great kind of piece of communication, actually, which is more than just having a chat and then going away and forgetting about it. Instead, you're bringing those issues to life. You're making sure that policymakers respond. Uh, and I think that that's going to help tremendously in those communities to level up. Welcome to Blue Collar Conversations live from the Blue Boar and I'm here with Deanna Davidson and also Paul Howell and we're taking your views and your comments, what you've been saying all day as you've been watching us live on the Daily Express. So we had a poll running today and that poll was, would you be willing to spend more to buy British products? Well, would you be willing to spend more to buy British products? products at the moment that poll is running at 96 percent of you said yes you would be prepared to pay more and we'll be talking a little bit more about that but yesterday we were in Mansfield and we were talking about education and really what does the country need to be doing and people are saying here now red tune uh, 1892 the government needs to reintroduce training centers we've got Queen Anne and she's saying we need training courses for youngsters university well that's great but only for a small percentage of people and as she sees it it's three years of fun and partying which is not what it should be about actually I have to question that Queen Anne if it is fun and partying at the moment as they're all quarantined and locked in their rooms and we've got a uh, rich uh, guy 007 uh, and he too says look we need more people actually having training uh, courses and he again is questioning how many hours studying people are doing a week uh, at university, six hours he's saying there. And the other thing that came through loud and clear as you've been emailing us is thank goodness we've got a TV station for us for too long the BBC now is for woke 
liberal, uh, it's a woke liberal agenda, says Ken. And somebody else is saying here, this is another Ken Coltus, who's saying we need to uh, be proud of our country, stand up for the silent majority, because the BBC has been way too politicised. So is the BBC way too politicised? Do we think that? Um, I, I, I think there's certainly an argument for that. When you look at coverage over things like Brexit over the years, it certainly seemed like there's been a bit of a tinge to it, which has been far more sort of remain focused and far more critical of Brexit as a, as a kind of project, as an idea, than I think actually reflects most people out there in society. Um, so I think to some extent, yes. You know, some of the cultural output of the BBC is really good. I love a bit of Downton Abbey. You can <laughs> take that bit aside from the political coverage, um, and I think the BBC is really valuable, but we certainly need to keep an eye on the, the direction the BBC is moving in. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there with the Brexit coverage. It was so out of kilter with what the whole country was saying. When they looked at what the general election was going to be, it was so out of kilter that what went on. Maybe it's because it is so centralised just in London in its own little bubble and that's what people were talking about. You're not speaking to the people in the rest of the country. But I think the key thing today is, would you be willing to spend more to buy British, Paul? Oh, of course. I think it's, um, it, 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 it always feels good to support your local environment, you know, whether that's your local town, whether it's your town centre, whether it's your county, whether it's your parliamentary seat in our cases, or whether it's the country. Um, you know, there's always limits. You know, you're not going to pay twice as much for something, but I think you know, paying a small premium to get what you know is coming from people um, that's you know, creating jobs in our part of the world yeah. is absolutely a, a good thing to do, and I'd very much stand behind that. Yeah, well, Chris Colbert from Leeds has uh, emailed in and said, government should run a media campaign by British for Brexit. Brexit, encourage the nation to buy British and also grow your own. Is this something, and I know when I was in Sedgefield with you in the North East, I really got this feel of coming together. Some people even said on the ground, COVID had brought communities together. We were looking after one another, seeing what we needed down our road, down our street. Shouldn't we be doing the same? with uh, the whole country and buying British. So do you get that feeling, Deanna, when you're out and about, people are really proud? Oh, completely. There's an amazing sense of community in the North East that I don't think anywhere else in the country has. I mean, I've got to be biased and say that, but I really do believe it. Um, and I think there's definitely that, that sort of proudness of being British, proudness of standing up for the, the values that, that we have as a country. Um, and and I, one of my favourite visits that I've ever been on was actually in, in Paul's patch of the EBAC washing machine factory, where every single washing machine gets a Union Jack sticker put on there to prove that this is the best of British, it's high quality, and it's really, you know, selling, promoting, being proud of our incredible exports. Um, yeah, th there is that. The North East is incredible. The UK is incredible. Um, and I think it's time we as politicians started talking about that an awful lot more. And that's another thing that came up and emails are coming through. It's saying, you know, we don't stand up and shout about how good we are. We're sort of very quiet, uh, maybe restrained, uh, and really we should be, I think, blowing our own trumpet with some of the phrases that, that have come through. Uh, Paul, do you think that? Well, very much so. And I think you go back to what you said a few minutes ago about you know the London-centric bubble on the BBC and things like that. It's the same in terms of the way our economy is being driven. You know, it's been driven by the London-centric services market and not thinking enough about manufacturing, about the fact that we can make things, we do make things. And you know, again on the COVID discussion, you know, just look at all the things that we couldn't get at the start of this uh, pandemic: face masks, because they were all coming from China. You know. I understand that now it's a very high percentage of the orders that are placed, I think it's north of 70%, might even be higher than that, is actually orders placed in the UK now, as opposed to being China and wherever, where it was something like 2% at the start of the pandemic. And I think that's just a microcosm of the way that this has changed people's perception that actually a shorter supply chain is not only good for local manufacturing, it's good for integrity of supply, it's good for all sorts of different reasons, and we just need to build on that. 
So it was a wake-up call to what we can and can't get our hands on should there be a pandemic, should there be a shortage. And of course, countries will use it for their home supply, as it were, or wherever they've got stronger supply connections with. But we ourselves weren't making some vital equipment or vital components. And maybe, maybe that will drive a, uh, this renaissance of made in Britain. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I saw that was absolutely incredible was in, in those early weeks of the pandemic when we knew that we'd need things like ventilators and respirators. Uh, we saw businesses stepping up to, to diversify, to change their production lines, to really try and feed into that national effort. And people referred to it as a bit of a wartime effort, and that is how it felt. It shows that our businesses are these amazing powerhouses that can adapt, can manufacture, and can make some of those amazing products that you know work for us in the UK, but we can also export out there in the world. Um, and we needn't be afraid of that. And I think, you know, once again, we, we get onto the Brexit debate, but I think we need to see this as a massive opportunity for Britain to take its place in the world, to go out there with open arms and say, we're here, we mean business, and we want to trade with you. And I think seeing something as business, as government, as, you know, the public sector, as the private sector, I think that initiative, uh, particularly with uh, at the start of COVID, where we saw Formula One and car companies coming together to do the respirators, uh, respirators then I think we need to make sure we do more of that, mm -hmm. make sure there is those stronger connections between business and government. And that's really what they were saying in Sedgefield, wasn't it? Oh, very much so. You know, they, they wanted a, the, the full engagement. And, um, you know, Sedgefield is a, a, a fabulous place. You know, we've got some t some co companies in the places like Netpark and Sedgefield itself that are just at the leading edge of technology. You know, these companies are dealing with the Home Office and people like that as a natural trading situation, but they need to get more emphasis behind them. It needs to be more of a, a natural thing. You know, government procurement has to, and should in the future just reflect the fact that there's a, a socio-economic benefit to actually buying in the UK and not just be cost, cost, cost in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the Green Book or what, in terms of how things are assessed. And when there was that earthquake, which really did start in the North East, that political earthquake, we talk about people wanting to take back control. I mean, your seat, Paul, Sedgefield, that was Tony Blair's seat. That is a Labour seat, had 25,000 majority. And then it sort of whittled away, whittled away, whittled away. Uh, so it didn't happen overnight. People gradually had got... Um, I don't know, how can we say, disgruntled with Labour, really felt they weren't on their side. Did you think uh, you were going to win? And it's an interesting conversation here because, Deanna, you stood there two years before. So between you, what was happening on the ground in the North East? Oh, I think as you said, Esther, it, it, it was a, a, prog a progression, you know. Um, you know. The wave started a long time back. The wave started with people just not taking enough care and looking after our part of the world. Um, you know, we had serious numbers of cabinet members that were, you know, in Tony Blair's time, you know, that they, I don't know what percentage of the cabinet, but a good percentage were actually in our patch. But you saw yourself when you were on the doors, what did they do for us? Was the sort of ground fell you were getting. And then what we saw, I mean, you know, in yesterday's conversation, you talk about Bansfield and you know, obviously, you know, Ben started a, a, a bit of a thing down there. Um, for us, it was a different Ben that started the process in the North East. Oh, yeah. You know, Ben Houchin and the uh, the Tees Valley Mayor just started to give people a sign as to what it was like to have a Conservative in charge and a sign of people, somebody who was going to be optimistic and looking up and trying to shout positively about our part of the world. And that then became a, almost a permission that actually, hey, it's not bad that. Yeah, I'll have a piece of that, please. And, you know, my Sedgefield constituency has half of the Tees Valley Mayor and half of not. And, you know, you, you, you do get the discussions. Well, can we not have a, a bit of what's over the water then? And I think that that politically pushed through. And that's why, you know, I think that the, the national position in terms of the Conservatives and the understanding that we were actually going to be more optimistic and drive things helped very much me to get elected. But the reason I've got so much of a majority now is because of things like Ben and the, and the permissions that have come. From around. And Deanna had done a bit of the spade work well, <laughs> in yeah. 2017, but you worked together on that. Yeah, I, mean, I did a lot of working with Deanna at the time. Yeah. So, I mean, so I, did you know it was good? You, did you know you, you were going to win in 2019? Deanna, did you see that Paul was going to win in 2019? Or was it a shock? 
I, I don't think it was a shock whatsoever, to be honest. I mean, you, 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 were, you were there with me and Bishop Auckland, so you saw the, the sense of kind of excitement, optimism and hope and support that people were showing for the Conservative Party, the likes of which has sort of never been seen. And Sedgefield, obviously, admittedly, a slightly tougher seat than mine in, in some ways, but I had absolutely no doubt in my mind that if, if we had a decent election result, that Paul would be over that line. And what a historic victory it was over in Sedgefield. Yeah. But, it, it, you know, it was the character type of the people, because, yes, we were knocking on doors together, and people would come out and say, yeah, Deanna, you know, let's have a selfie or a photo. <laughs> let's get this done. Let's mm -hmm. deliver this. And that, I felt, the spirit of the people there. W what do you think was going on? Do you felt they'd been warned? down by Labour not delivering for a long time and I really did feel there was this sort of burst of energy. Mm, I, I think so you know you, you look back at, at sort of representation across the North East and it's been Labour for such a long time and yet all people have seen is their communities decline, jobs move out of the area you know they haven't seen things get better and at the end of the day what do we want? We want, we want the best possible lives for ourselves, for our children, for our families. So if people aren't seeing things get better, then you know it's 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 our job as as the Tories to give them a sign that we can do something new, and we were really selling that. Um, and I think the difference between 2017 and 2019, I mean that movement was happening, but what happened in between was Labour just going against the wishes of the people on Brexit, which kind of made people think, hmm, okay, maybe these are not the ones who are speaking up for me anymore. And then it was our job to go in there and prove that we were on the side of regular hardworking people. And we did that. And I think what we've really managed to do as a party, particularly through Blue Collar, which is a fantastic organisation, is prove that we are on the side of ordinary working people. We're there for the plumbers, we're there for the electricians, we're there for the hairdressers. Uh, in, a, in a way to really modernise what the Conservative Party looks like, who it is we're delivering for, you know, whereas 20 years ago we were seen as something very different. And the levelling up agenda. Mm -hmm. How important is that on the ground for us to get right? So important. Um, I know throughout my time knocking on doors, what I was saying to people is, look, you, you've seen nothing but decline for a really long time. Give us a chance and we'll deliver something. Give us a chance, try something new. If we don't deliver, kick us out in five years' time, but give us a go. People are really counting on us to deliver. They're really counting on us to deliver things in our local communities, to deliver you know, better educational prospects, to crack down on crime, to improve transport, to make lives better. Um, and you know, it's, I think levelling up has to be at the very heart and the very core of everything that our government does. And it's a phrase, levelling up, but what do you think people see that as meaning? Well, I, 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 I know from my perspective, what I view levelling up as is ensuring that, you know, through the policies we put into place, it doesn't matter whether you're born in, uh, in, in Bishop Auckland, in Richmondshire, in, in a leafy suburb in the South East, you can still get on if you're willing to work hard enough. To me, that's what it means, and that means driving up education. It means cracking down on, on crime in areas that are hit by it and where people see their, them, them, uh, themselves and their families suffering through it. It means making sure that people can get from town to town to village to village to get those good jobs. And it means making sure that those jobs are in place so that people have got a chance of a good job and a good life and buying a home in their community without having to flock to a major city somewhere else. To me, that's what levelling up is all about. And this buying British, this made in the UK, that surely, is that part of it, Paul? Well, it, it has to be. And you know, part of the levelling up is about you know, getting more manufacturing opportunities for people, getting actually the jobs back into parts of the world like that. Um, it, it's just so fundamental it's, it's that, that we do that sort of thing. And it's, um, you know, in terms of levelling up, I think levelling up, it's about levelling up opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that they've seen, you know, one of the things that I certainly got on the door um, was, and where are you from? Are you from <laughs> round here? You know, they, they wanted assurances that you were close enough to care and that you were embedded in that community, you know, as, as to where it was. You know, I mean, I know, like, Diana, you were it's as local as I am, but, you know, when you got selected for bishop, you then lived there for a year, so by the time yeah, yeah. the election came, you were well embedded and people knew that you cared about that patch. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, therefore that was one, well, I only had four questions. It was, you know, it was Brexit, it was Corbyn, it was, you know, what have they done for us, and then where are you from? 
The horse will, the horse with the questions on the door. And people does that care mean, about yeah. yourself. Do you care is what they're saying. How much do you care? Are you going to be here for the boat and then we're not going to see you again? Is that what they were angling for, having seen that, as you said, whether it was Tony Blair or Mandelson, all these people were supposedly there, but they weren't. They were back in London only thinking about sort of London and their job. Is that what they were asking you? Was that at the heart of that question? Will you be here for us tomorrow? And do you really understand what we're going through? I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Esther. You know, that it's very much about do you understand us? Do you understand what we're about? Do you understand what we need? Um, are you part of us? You know, will you be part of us going forward? Um, you know, will you just, um, you know, if we elect you, will you then just disappear down there and start talking in their language and not in our language? Will you start talking about the things that um, matter to the, um, the South East and the business bubble in the South as opposed to what is it, our real community stuff? So, so, no, absolutely, they want us to, you know, what we see with the whole blue collar conservatism is that range across the country of people who are from their communities. I think it's also about appreciating everybody for what they do. It is understanding <coughs> you need the bricky as much as you need the conveyancing solicitor. Mm. It's the fact that you need the person who's doing, as you say, the, the bricky, the chippy, the plumber, the plasterer, yeah. as much as you need somebody uh, to do the bank conveyancing. And I think that's it. Maybe for too long we've overlooked well, the people who get, get the country going. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes to, you know, to, to part of the conversation from last night, doesn't it? You know, about giving people the right opportunities for the right type of education that's right for them. Not, you know, I mean, the old, you know, the Blair education, education, education wasn't that. It was university, university, university. Mm -hmm. What you want is for the people who want practical jobs to get practical training and, you know, the, the right thing that suits them, not the right thing that suits some academic trying to think about things in Westminster. And this what is from Fergus MacDonald and he said blue collar conservatives must stand up for the freedom to think, to speak, to be different, to challenge, get away from this political correctness, what you can and can't say, what you're allowed to do. Do you think you're standing up for that, Deanna? I think so. I think it's about just being a bit no nonsense and talking common sense. And so one of the things I did during my election campaign was, was you know, rather than doing town halls, inviting people to come to real stuffy meetings, I ran a series of, of kind of pub conversations inspired by the blue collar pub conversations where I'd go sit in a pub, advertise it on Facebook and say to people, I'm going to be here for two hours, three hours. I'll be having a pie. Come and sit with me, have a chat and let's talk about what matters to you. Because I think as politicians, we spend too long talking about what we think are the buzzwords, what we think are the issues of the day and not always enough time listening. So that was really invaluable for me and you know the fact it was in such a relaxed setting meant that we were able to talk in a really no-nonsense way about things and people appreciate that. They don't want a snazzy sound bite, they don't want you to sound like a, you know, a polished politician who's been trained by the Harvard Academy or something. What they want is someone who's real and someone who they know is going to stand up for them and their values. And I think when we talk about are you willing to pay more to buy British and on this poll we've had 96% of people say they would. What do you think that's going to the core of, the nub of there? I mean that's a heck of a lot of people saying we'd be prepared to pay more so long as it was British. What, what, what do you think that's getting to the heart of? Supporting each other. I think it's about, you know, the, the, the fact that if, you know, you go back to EBA, you know, you so need back to make washing machines and as long as humidifiers and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you're going to buy a washing machine and your mate is, has got a job at EBAC, you know you're helping him keep his job. You know, and I think if, 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 if that just is used as a, a metaphor for, you know, British industry per se, then, you know, whether you're buying, you know, whatever it is, if you're doing that in the UK, you're keeping somebody else in a job. You're helping the local economy. You're helping to get that position through. And I don't think we've got that message through often enough in the past. And we've been too much about trying to, you know, go into the, um, you know, the throwaway culture. Oh, it's cheap and cheaper. We'll have mm -hmm. something from, from China or wherever it's come from. Maybe but we I should be looking at things that are more to, sustainable. Yeah, you know? but if you're trying to um, purchase things on a tight budget, 
there will be a, a, a time where you think, well, I can't pay some more. So I'm just, you know, so I think we have to be mindful of what people can afford as well. Oh, so nice. what, you know, what can we, how do we divide this up? What should we get elsewhere? How do we save our pennies? What do we do? I'm just thinking that it's interesting that 96% mm -hmm. said they prepared to that. So I guess you've got to say, well, what would I do without? What can't I have if I'm paying more? I think it's, it's, as well, though, it, it, it depends on degree, doesn't it? It's like I said earlier in the conversation, you know, that if, if, if you're asked to pay twice as much for your washing machine, then I'm sorry, Eva, you're not going to make a, a, a turn. You've got to be competitive. But, you, you know, as long as your prices are competitive, people will, you know, take cognizance of the fact that it's a, a British brand. If you are out of the park, then business doesn't work that way. Yeah, you know, people don't work that way. They've, they've got... You know, there's only so many pennies in the pocket at the start of the week. And that's you know. what I was getting back to when you talked about the sort of pragmatism of the sort of people you represent. When you talk about the common sense of the people mm. you represent, that has to be taken into, uh, into account too. So we have got to be competitive, globally competitive. We do need to be selling away. Mm. But I think that's really uh, wonderful that the British public want to support one another. I completely yeah. agree, and I think what it shows is this incredible sense of, of kind of patriotism that we see right across our communities. But it's something that, for some reason, um, in, in the Westminster bubble, people seem a little bit ashamed of and a little bit frightened to talk about, particularly at the moment amongst the Labour Party. I mean, the way that they voted on the Armed Forces Bill was absolutely madness. Crappy. You know, just I, I couldn't actually believe it. And it did not resonate with people in my constituency who, you know, are patriotic. They're right behind our veterans. They want to see the UK succeed in a very proud to fly that Union Jack. Why do you but think it's, we it's stop being proud? It's strange, isn't it, You know, that, um, you know, the, so much not wanting to support the armed forces in that thing, mm -hmm. and yet the people that actually voted against it then sacked them. So where's the, you know, it, it's just about standing up for what you believe in, and it's about standing behind the principles as to what you're talking about. And when people talk about pride, when, when do you think we started to lose that pride or that confidence in ourselves? When people talk about, look, we want to be proud, we want to talk about sort of our British culture, our heritage. Where do you think we lost that? I don't think the, the public and regular people out there did. I think the bubble has, but I don't think people out there ever have. I think they've always been proud. You know, you look at great events like, like I don't know, the Olympics, the World Cup, whatever it is, those sort of things that bring our nation together. And right across the North East, right across Sheffield where I grew up, there are people there with their flags, everyone's engaged, everyone wants to see our country do really, really well. It's just, it's when it comes to talking about it in these grand terms politically that it seems to have kind of dropped yeah. back, I think. But you can also take it as, you know, <laughs> maybe it's an appropriate comment for the whole Brexit thing, EU regulations. You know, about every procurement decision that's taken by local government, by national government, has to give a fair chance to everybody that can possibly buy it or for possibly supply right across Europe. And I think you lose your local identity on that because, mm. you know, it, 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 people are then trying to, it's in the administrators of these sort of decisions, are trying to do what they've got to do within the rules, but the people outside in, in the real world are looking at it and saying, that's not fair. It's not reasonable, you know, I don't think any of us believe that the French or the Germans or the Italians follow those rules as robustly as we appear to have done in the past. And I think that that's another reason why the whole Brexit thing has spun that way, because people just want their businesses and their environment to be given at least first amongst equals, yeah. and maybe slightly better than that, just to be the first point, as opposed to be, well, no, no, it's tuppence cheaper out of Italy. Sorry, that doesn't work. And uh, uh, people, actually, it was from Newcastle wrote in about that. We do have to think about um, maybe government contracts being a little bit more, um, I shan't say weighted towards uh, the, the uh, British contract winning something like, as you say, the trains from, from Newcastle, but we have to think of it in the round. What does it mean to a local community? Mm -hmm. How do we get that money circulating back into a local community? How are we going to get that procurement, which was very big in Sedgefield, how do we get that procurement, government procurement, mm -hmm. to work for us here in the UK and locally in mm -hmm. Sedgefield? Oh, and, uh, and if, if you, you talk to the people, um, you know, like the Furry Hill lot, who were about Furry Hill Station and getting that you know, back onto the map and there, 
they would like nothing better than not just for Furry Hill Station to be back in place so they can connect to everywhere, but, but even better if Furry Hill Station was built by local manufacturing companies mm -hmm. who build things like that, you know, Finley Structures, who you saw build structures, you know, steel structures, they'll be in that sort of thing. You know, attach it in, in Newton Aircliffe to put the trains on the line. You know, all of those sort of things would just resonate. It, it would be like the icing on the cake of putting that station there. If they were then seeing things that were built and made in the local area that, um, that, that just enhanced that whole position. And Bishop Auckland, what do you think people would want? Oh my gosh, I could give you a very long list of what people would want. That they want to come and get the train from... Station, just I'm, sure, I'm sure that's it's it, that's a good pitch. I, think <laughs> that, I, I do think that's the other thing that central government doesn't get local connections no, to be big. able to get from A to B. Now in London yeah. you can jump on a tube and be anywhere, but I think unless you get out of London you don't understand how difficult it is to get from uh, each of the mm. uh, cities across uh, the country or from suburb to city or from home to work and that I think has to be something we deliver on mm. this connection locally. Well, we've I, both I got you know, very similar agree. constituencies in that yeah, area, very big geographic spreads. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we've both got, as, as Paul says, those <coughs> geographic spreads, lots of small communities that are sort of connected by road, which is great. But, you know, I know in my patch, to get from one village to another that you could walk in 40 minutes would take you two and a half hours on buses. It's absolute madness. So we really need to be looking at that as part of our levelling up agenda. And I think we need to be a bit more mindful when we're making those sort of national infrastructure decisions as well about how it plays out. You know, saving a few minutes off a journey time to London is great, but a lot of people in my patch don't regularly get a train to London. What they want is a bus to get from Camden to, uh, to Bishop or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, we need to give a lot more consideration to that, I think. Yeah, and, and, and particularly with transport, it's, it's about integration. Mm. It's about having the whole linkage between buses and trains and, and I think planes, the whole thing together. Yeah, and that's a disconnect, I think, between London and the rest of the country what, 100 plus billion on high speed two for an extra couple of minutes shaved off the speed from London to a couple of cities when really we need that spent locally on roads, mm -hmm. on buses, on our local sort of connection from town to town. I think that is key. And when people equally in London say, oh, people want more money in the north, it's a, no, no, we haven't had any money for a long period <laughs> yeah. of time. At the moment, it's only an hour, uh, uh, once an hour train service from places like Nutsford to Manchester. Mm -hmm. That's unthinkable in London Absolutely. to have that you, you couldn't connect between <coughs> sort of Nutsford to Manchester. And you know, unbelievable. We've got to get this sorted for our regions. Of, of, of course we do. And you know, to get from, you know, my constituency to London is quicker than getting from my constituency to you in Liverpool, you know, mm -hmm. in, in Tatton, in, in, in Manchester. Those in, getting across right. the country yeah. is just awful in and terms that of that. And you know, the, the whole I, I get the HS2 in terms of the capacity argument. I don't get the, you know, the couple of minutes off the Birmingham run, but the whole idea of getting more capacity on the rail I think is a good idea. And I like the fact that a lot of my constituents they, they are keep, getting jobs they from keep, it. They keep we can changing talk about the what the argument is. It's <laughs> oh. gone from speed to capacity, from Manchester yeah. Airport to uh, Heathrow to now jobs. To be fair, nobody's on the trains. I mean, that money, yeah. absolutely, if you're prioritising spend and we're a conservative government who believes in prioritisation and value for money, you'd be spending that money elsewhere now. But for us, locally, across the regions, not just the north, I mean the whole of the country, we need our local connections. We do. And again, it goes back to that point about employment and opportunities. Because if you're a young kid who doesn't drive and you want to get a job, but you can't get a bus from your village into the nearest town in a timely fashion, there's that job opportunity gone for you. It's about those human stories. And, those and didn't Joe things. say that in Sedgefield? He said, my friend wanted to get a job in Newcastle. Yeah. Three hours to get there, mm. it should only have been half an hour by train, which meant he didn't get a job. Mm. And you're quite right, it's the cost, it's the time, inconvenience. Yeah, and that's where we go in terms of the HS2 ready argument up there, because we need things like the Lame Side Line back in, which connects us from, you know, enables the connection between the T's, the Tyne, the Weir, mm -hmm. and all of those pieces in between, extends the, the, the metro situ situation, joins Furry Hill, not only to the south, which we can do relatively easily on the current plans, but gets us up to the north, and makes you know, places like that become, you know, commuter places, obviously, but it's, it's almost like Furry Hill becomes a park and ride to get to Newcastle, or it gets get you into Durham or get you to Teesside, then people will want to live there. And therefore you'll get the, the whole economic growth so, that goes with those communities. So our, our levelling up, whether it is digital, 
uh, capability, whether it is local transport. This is what we're talking about, levelling up, allowing pe people to have a fair chance to get a job, mm -hmm. to get to school, to get wherever they want to go to. Paul, Deanna, fantastic. We're still taking emails, we're still taking your opinions. Tomorrow we're going to be in West Yorkshire. Uh, we've got Pretty Patel, the Home Secretary, uh, speaking to us and we're going to be talking about kicking out crime. We need to be, uh, the Tory party needs to be the party of law and order. So that's what we'll be discussing tomorrow. So see you then. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be back tomorrow and we want to hear from you. So email us at opinion at bluecollarconservatism.co.uk. Blue Collar Conservatism is all about turning politics on its head and taking politics to the people.